let me play slideshow. All right, so welcome everybody to uh, our season finale for Husky Bites season five. Husky Bites is a free webinar uh, that is uh, organized and uh, by Michigan Tech and by um, myself. I'm, a, I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering at Michigan Tech. My name is Janet Callahan. I can be reached through my email at callahan at mtu.edu. And this session is dedicated in memory of Darwin Moon. Uh, and I have a slide about Darwin, um, a very special husky who we recently lost. And I knew I wouldn't be able to, to read this. So you're gonna have to read it to yourself. Darwin Moon, gone too soon. We miss you. All right, I'm gonna pull it together now. Thank you everyone who has sponsored Husky Bites this spring. And I have a list of them here, uh, including uh, Marnie and the Easts, uh, uh, Virgil and Lucille Davis, and of course the Moons. And if we have missed acknowledging you as a sponsor, you send me an email, um, either send it to Callahan at MTU or send it to engineering at MTU. Um, all right, so I had the pleasure of meeting Tom and Sue in Green Bay on my way, on my drive back from Chicago, which was now two weeks ago. Uh, and they uh, were so gracious, they invited me into their home. Uh, and we had lunch and look at them, they're wearing their Michigan Tech Husky gear. And I did wanna mention, uh, in June, I will um, be in Minneapolis for a conference, and I was going to organize an alumni event, uh, uh, probably Wednesday, June 29th, although that's tentative. And so if you would like, if you live in that area and you would like to keep be keep kept informed about this, you just uh, drop us an email, either to myself or to engineering at mtu.edu. Uh, and it, it, it's a real pleasure to meet um, Huskies out there. Uh, it's, it's the favorite part part of my, of my wonderful job. So season six will begin September 19th. An easy way to remember that would be the first Monday after Labor Day. And then um, season seven begins the first Monday after Martin Luther King Day. And each of them will be 10 week sessions. And I look forward to seeing all of us again. And I'm gonna miss you all summer. Uh, uh, I, it's become part of my, what I do on Mondays, you know, just, just like many of you. I want to thank, um, on behalf of all of us, our Husky Bites team. Uh, so behind the scenes, we have Sue Hill, we have Kim Geiger, and we have Danielle Davis. Thank you so much, team, for all your terrific work, uh, making this such a, such a huge success. All right, and with that, I, I thank the audience. I, uh, in advance, I thank our speakers. Uh, and uh, this is a, um, uh, a name that butterfly moment here. Uh, uh, come on, I got two experts. What's this, what, what's this butterfly? This was on my um, butterfly bush last summer, right outside my house. That is a monarch. You're going oh, to hear about that today. Excellent. I have monarch butterflies who visit me. <laughs> With that, I'm winding up a little bit early. Um, well, I, I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'm going to introduce, um, briefly introduce our speakers. So we have two speakers today, um, uh, Thomas Werner, who is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, and then we have um, alum, Tessa Steenwinkel, who uh, um, recently graduated with many different awards. Uh, just a few words about, about uh, Dr. Werner. Um, he is the 2021 recipient of the Distinguished Professor of the Year of Michigan. And he's going to say a little bit more about himself, so I'm going to limit my, remark, my remarks to that. About Tessa, again, I'm going to be brief because they each have intro slides, but Tessa, um, Tessa's accomplishments at Michigan Tech can be summarized by saying she won all the awards we have, including the Barry Goldwater Fellowship. She earned a master's degree here, and most recently, I guess today or yesterday, she learned that she's also won 
the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Award, which is, which is a very, very difficult award to receive. It's not, not just a function of academic excellence, it's also a question of the research project you propose in your own words, and also the, 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 the research record that you have brought with you to that award. Uh, and so congratulations, Tessa. And Dr. Werner, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And I wanna thank you both so much in advance um, for, um, uh, you know, uh, for taking on the sort of end of season, um, season five Husky Bites. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, and welcome everyone. Can you see my screen because I don't see, okay, good. Can you see my mouse over the screen here? Good, so I'm walking on the left screen. All right, everyone, um, welcome. And uh, we are going to learn a little bit about butterflies, moths, and fruit flies tonight. And I brought my super famous and successful student, former student, unfortunately, Tessa Seenringle with me, who has done a lot of research with me. Um, so first of all, I come from East Germany, as you can certainly judge from my accent. Uh, I started catching my first butterfly down here in Erfurt in East Germany. And uh, that made me become a biologist. When I became a biologist, I started working on uh, biology and I did my master's in vaccine development in human heart disease causing viruses. Uh, I didn't like viruses too much, so I went up to Sweden, to the north part of Sweden, and studied fruit fly immunology. So I came a little bit closer to my real interest, which are insects. Why do we study fruit fly immunology? Not because we care about how fruit flies get sick, but actually fruit flies are closely related to humans, closely enough so that we can understand our own immune system when we study fruit flies. Then I took a leap over the big lake here uh, and landed in Madison, Wisconsin, where Tessa is sitting now, decades later. Um, I studied wonderful, beautiful fruit flies that are so pretty. They almost look like mini zebras and mini leopards. And uh, I spent five years in Sean Carroll's lab to study the evolution of development of fruit flies. And then um, I made the last leap up to Houghton, Michigan, where I became assistant professor of biology in 2010, and I got tenure in 2018, and here I am, and that's my kids sitting up on a huge snow pile uh, next to the admin building. All right, the next picture, oops, the next picture shows Tessa and me. We have been walking into Huron Mountains for the last five, four years. She has been helping me tremendously identifying thousands and thousands of fruit flies. Um, this is the in the Huron Mountain Club, the, the stone house where we usually uh, live in order to do our research. And then down here on the left, you see us uh, putting together a, a bucket uh, with which you can catch moths. And we are going to tell you a little bit more about that. And here you see some nicely laid out uh, tomatoes that Tessa put actually in Madison, Wisconsin out. And she found two new fruit flies to Wisconsin, and uh, that made her uh, basically contribute also to our fruit fly book that we are going to talk about a little bit later. So I hand it over to Tessa. <laughs> yeah, hello everyone. Uh, it's so nice to, to be here today. Um, I am also from the other side of the pond. Um, I originally uh, was born in the Netherlands. Um, and then back in 2012, um, my family and I, we moved down to Louisiana. Baton Rouge specifically. And after spending two years there, uh, we moved up to Madison, Wisconsin uh, for my dad's work at the time. I finished high school there and had to decide where to go to college. Um, obviously, there's a lot of options uh, going to college, but uh, once I had visited Houghton and Dr. Thomas Warnett's lab, I really fell in love with the place. So I decided to move there a few months later. Um, I spent the, uh, three and a half years there as an undergrad uh, working uh, for, for Thomas and um, also working on my own project there. Um, I decided that I couldn't leave Michigan Tech behind after the three and a half years and uh, tacked on an accelerated master's that I just finished up back in December. Um, after that came to an end, I had to decide uh, what would be next. And I'm happy to say that I'll be heading down to uh, Baylor College of Medicine uh, for a PhD this coming fall. So moving on from that, um, we're going to start by asking you our first question um, relating to moths and butterflies. 
And we hope to see if you might know what the difference is between moths and butterflies. And the options include that the shape of their antennae might be different, that the size of their wings is different, or what time of day they are active is different. There are some nice responses coming in here, <laughs> helping us to figure out what the real answer is, because we don't know. We just asked the question and we hope that <laughs> anyone can tell us. <laughs> we want to learn from you guys. Well, oh. people, people are, are leaning toward either A or C. It looks pretty much like A. Okay, I think they have all voted. Um, congratulations. The shape of the antenna is the only way to tell if it is a butterfly or moth. Okay, Tessa, do you want to explain this? Yeah, as it turns out, as we just said, the only difference is really the antennae, where uh, butterflies have long, skinny antennae, um, and the moths look more like a, a leaf of some kind, more shorter and more brushy. Very nice. And I will take it from here and tell you a little bit about butterflies, okay? You will get to hear Tessa's voice soon again. Don't be sad. She is right <laughs> back here. Um, butterflies. Oh, we have another question. Here is a question. What is the correct order of developmental stages? A, egg, pupa, prepupa, caterpillar, adult. B, egg, caterpillar, prepupa, pupa, adult or C, egg, pre-pupa, caterpillar, pupa, adult? Ha. Huh. This is hard. Oh, no, <laughs> the, oh, everyone is really good. Very well-educated people here in this room. My goodness, look at these people. Oh, someone, now it's going back. Oh, <laughs> yeah. now the people pre with the wrong answers are daring to give some uh, clues here, but... <laughs> This is what I happens think... in the classroom. The students see what the other people are voting and then they <laughs> yeah. all change their mind. It's all about right. learning. <laughs> okay, it looks like we are done voting. Um, the majority is for B, egg, caterpillar, pre-pupa, pre-pupa, and adult. And this is correct. Very good. So um, let me just quickly show you how this works. I'm not going to tell you what butterfly species that is because that will also be a question for you guys. Here is an egg, okay? Small egg on a leaf. There is a tiny caterpillar. There is a huge caterpillar. And this thing is eating and molding and eating and molding and so on, right? The, the skin doesn't grow with the caterpillars. It just, it's like an air balloon. You, you pump it up and then at some point it explodes and you need a bigger balloon. Then we have the pre-pupa. Look at this thing. It's basically a caterpillar that is preparing to form a pupa underneath its caterpillar skin. And then it makes a pupa or chrysalis. In, in butterflies, we say chrysalis, okay? So now what comes out of this chrysalis? You can see the wing color already. And I believe we have another question here. And there it is. What butterfly species is in this chrysalis? Is it A, a monarch? B, a cabbage white, or C, a white admiral. Ah. Oh, people, people, people. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I, I, as a test taker, I would choose one of the ones with the word white in it because I would just guess that that would be the right answer because there there's two of them. There <laughs> there's two of them. Right in there. <laughs> so well, I'm going to go with white admiral just because I have no clue. Okay, yeah, so probably because people know the monarch the best, um, it is unfortunately the white admiral. So have a look at this when this thing comes out. Uh, so the, this is the right forewing. This is the head down here. This is the right forewing. It's hanging upside down, okay? And now there is the white admiral, hooray. And why is this the white admiral? Not because it's white, but it has some white. And there is also something called a red admiral and that has red here, okay? So it's a black butterfly. And you can see it outside if you go um, in June, July, uh, usually around June, early summer, out in the woods, uh, they are feeding on dirt paths, just the moisture and also some poop of animals. If your dog poops somewhere on the road, right? The, the, these guys are going to come. 
Now, if you go further down to Madison, Wisconsin or Southern uh, Michigan, you will find something that looks like this, the red spotted purple. And guess what? The red spotted purple and the white admiral are the exact same species. Just when you come further down into the Southern parts, there is a poisonous butterfly that is very poisonous. It looks like this uh, red spotted purple and wherever the the pipevine swallowtail, which is the poisonous species, wherever that has been seen in the last 20 years, our species looks like the pipevine swallowtail. It's a mimicry, okay? The exact same species. Aha, we learned something new. I guess you did not know that. And somewhere between Houghton and Madison, there is the borderline, and there's a pretty sharp break where you see either the white admiral to the north or the, uh, the red spotted purple to the south. All right, what is this? Next Chris question, what is this? Is it a monarch, is it a viceroy, or is it a red admiral? Ha, huh. this is going to be interesting. <laughs> I was waiting for this for the whole day for this, Chris. Oh my gosh, very good. Huh. We've got a smart audience. They learn fast. We have a I'm very smart you. audience. Because they already ready? saw a picture of a monarch. I, think I am they very just saw proud the admiral. <laughs> but this is hard. It took me years to figure out um, what the difference is. I couldn't even see the difference in the beginning. Okay, we have a clear winner here. This is a viceroy. Very nice. This is a viceroy. And the viceroy, um, it looks like a monarch, but if you look very carefully where my mouse goes here on the hind wing, there is a black line. And that is typical for the Viceroy. And now I'm going to tell you a really fun story. When I didn't have a green card, my wife went to Mexico and I collect banknotes and I asked her, please bring me some banknotes. So this is the monarch here. Okay, it doesn't have this, this black line. So she brought me banknotes and I started laughing because the monarch is the national butterfly of Mexico. And uh, it's a 50 pesos note. And uh, my wife said, why are you laughing? I said, because not, not even the Mexicans know what their national animal looks like, because look at these two butterflies, these are viceroys. And my wife said, no, it can't be. They, they know what they are doing, especially on banknotes, right? So um, you see that black line here, they are clearly viceroys. My wife wouldn't believe me until we went to Mexico the next time. And I told her, see, they took them out. They were ashamed of their mistake. They took the viceroys <laughs> out and replaced them with some kind of weird ghost image here. So, um, so much about the viceroy, but that can't happen to our audience because our audience is smarter. Maybe you guys should uh, work at the National Mint in uh, Mexico or something, like right? print some banknotes. Uh, if you ever want to see monarch caterpillars, look at your milkweed, you will probably find them. And then you find beautiful pupae or chrysalis and they have gold here, but don't be too greedy because as soon as this butterfly hatches, the gold will be gone. There's nothing left. Um, you may wonder what is, what's the deal with the red admiral? Well, the red admiral kind of looks like the white admiral, but the, the, the white is replaced with red. They are not very closely related, um, the red admiral. Is also a migratory butterfly, just like the monarch, but many people don't know about this. They also come from southern United States and migrate up every year and then go back down in fall, as does the American painted lady. Kind of looks more like a monarch. This is also a migratory butterfly. And there are different ladies in the United States. The American painted lady has these two giant eye spots here on the hind wing on the side. And it also has this white dot in the middle of orange. That's when you know it's an American lady. And one more to show you what you see in early spring. These guys, the morning cloaks, they hibernate as adult butterflies underneath tree logs and in your sheds. And when the sun comes out in spring for the first time, you will see these guys flying around and you wonder, oh, why do we have butterflies? It's still snow on the ground. Well, this is because your shed got hit by sunlight and it got too warm and these guys are coming out. So this is a beautiful butterfly of the Northern hardwoods. Uh, I'm sure many of you guys have seen this one. Um, here's the tiger swallowtail, the Canadian tiger swallowtail. They usually come in masses and they are just in the same places as the white admiral, usually on wet dirt roads and sucking from some animal poop. Uh, but they also go to flowers uh, very uh, often. 
All right. Uh, if you ever wondered how to catch a butterfly, this is how to catch a butterfly. You, Tessa ho holds the net really nicely. This is again in the Huron Mountain Club, a place that nobody ever gets in unless you are a billionaire or you have a research grant. So we are going to show you some shots from the Huron Mountain Club, but not too many, not to be invasive that we get uh, kicked out of the club because we are not allowed to show certain areas of that club. All right. I guess this is Tessa's turn again to tell us a little bit about some fun moths here. <laughs> yeah, so in addition to the, uh, the butterflies, uh, we do some moths. So uh, one that you may have seen or you also soon seen is the woolly bear, uh, characterized by its black head and end and brown intermediate. Um, it will eventually um, completely turn brown and be kind of somewhat of a boring actual moth. Um, so we have a quick question, hopefully that will trip you up. And the question is if the width of that orange section will actually indicate how long winter will be because they do come out right as the snow starts to disappear. I've heard this, I've heard this, and I, I've always thought it to be true, but look, the audience is voting false. They are voting <laughs> false, yeah. Now look at that, we've got already 93 votes here. We are closing into 100. I don't think much more will change. Tessa, what do you think about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are super smart because sadly it's indeed false. Um, it's about as reliable as the groundhog. Um, it will not tell us how long winter will be. Um, winter will always probably be around longer than you think. Um, luckily, it has some uh, closely related uh, brothers. Uh, here's a nice picture of the yellow bear appearing in several different colors, ranging from dark brown to an almost yellow color. Um, but they all turn out to be uh, beautiful white moths that you might see on the sides of uh, buildings in the summer. And then one more moth that is really worth our attention here is the poodle caterpillar. It is, um, it, you know, as the name says, it really almost looks like a curled up pool, a little pool, poodle uh, with in the center there, the actual caterpillar and its husk um, on the side. They will eventually turn into black and white spot and uh, moths coming out at night. And it actually looks surprisingly a lot like Dr. Werner's dog. Uh, here is featured as Frosty, um, but she's not a poodle. She's a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier instead. <laughs> so um, even though butterflies and moths are frequently beautiful, uh, they do cause some hazards from time to time. Uh, here's a tree that you might have seen. It has little pockets um, in the far out branches where the Eastern Trent caterpillar is currently making its home. Um, you might, as you will see on the next slide, uh, they make their way onto the roads, uh, occasionally causing slippery situations for cars, um, and they will come out in the masses um, in the spring. Uh, they, the, the moths are not particularly beautiful, being mainly brown and maybe a little chubby. Uh, so our next question for you is, what is this? It's kind of an evil looking bug. Um, pretending to be something it might not be. So what did you just see? Is it the early beginnings of a mouse, a parasitic wasp, or actually a lunar moth? Wow. You Dr. have Warner such will be hard answering this for us. I know, I know. Uh, well, I don't think it's a mouse. No. <laughs> Otherwise our title would be fit too well, right? <laughs> Oh, look at that, we are up to 100 and the great majority says it's a lunar moth and indeed it is, but, and I'm taking over here, Tessa will come back in the fruit flies. Why is this thing yellow? And why it doesn't have big wings? Well, this is because when they hatch out of the pupa, the wings are very small, just like this. And the green of the lunar moth is actually not in the wing color, they are actually pumping green blood into their yellow wings. And as you can see, as the wing expands on the upper half here, green blood is coming in, staining the wing green while the tips are yellow. And as this thing is unfolding, you can see whatever is not pumped in with blood is yellow. And then in the end, this beautiful lunar moth comes out. Uh, I have reared these myself, and this is one of the most fantastic uh, events you can ever imagine, having a lunar moth hatch in front of you. 
Um, and there we come to our next question here. Which one is the largest moth of North America? Is it A, the Cecropia moth with my little daughter Natalia here in the back? Um, or is it the Polyphemus moth that is covering my face? Or C, is it the Luna moth? Ah. <laughs> oh my goodness, how did you hold still? And how did you get that moth to land on your nose? Oh, actually, what I wanted is uh, that a male is coming. I wanted to actually have her outside. She was unfertilized, and I, I, I walked around with her um, to attract a male. Um, <laughs> but there was no male coming, so at some point, uh, the, the rearing this uh, wasn't possible. But I didn't walk too far with this. I didn't want to look weird. Uh, I put her in a, in a net <laughs> afterwards, um, but for the picture. Okay, so people say the polyphemus moth is the largest moth of North America. Unfortunately, it's not true. It is the Cecropia moth. Uh, that is officially the largest moth of North America, even if this thing, the polyphemus moth, looks really big in my face, right? But um, <laughs> they vary. Actually, they vary in size. They, there is size variation. And if you take the average, uh, the, the, the Cecropia moth actually wins, all right? OK, so how do you, oops, how do you collect, how do you catch moths? You put up a sheet on a table at night, and you put UV lights or black lights uh, underneath. And then you sit there. Uh, you chase the bears off, and uh, you chase uh, all the animals away that want to eat you. And then you focus on these moths that are coming. And some nights, there are hundreds of moths coming. And you can just look at them, count them, or take them for your collection. So the sheet is my favorite method, but it's not very effective because you are one person. You sit at the sheet for a couple of hours, and that's all you get. If you want to be oh, very and, effective. And, and so they're landing on the outside of the sheet. Yeah, they land on the outside of the sheet. You have actually five different sphinx moth species sitting here. That was a fantastic night. The quality of the night is like how many sphinx moth species do I get to see kind of sometimes, you know, this was really awesome. It was one of my favorite moth catching nights. Uh, then we have four buckets. These are automatic buckets that have a gas in the bottom and some egg cartons. And uh, you put them up here. This is also in the Huron Mountains. There are lots of mosquitoes out there. Tessa is helping me and we always run to this place. We call it the mosquito hell and it really deserves its name. Um, and uh, you put this bucket out and then there's a little battery and a, a black light on top and there is a funnel. And then the moths bang against the black light and fall through the funnel and fall asleep. And then the next day we come and bring the buckets into the field station and empty the buckets out into a kill jar. And then this is like the result of one bucket. There are a couple of hundred moths and then I plow through them and identify them. Um, it keeps me busy for about 800 hours in one fall season. I, I spent like the, all the fall months sitting every night with hundreds and hundreds of moths and I identify almost all of them to the species, which is kind of uh, a lot of work, as you can imagine. But we also have uh, very fun times here. Tessa is probably laughing about uh, the smell of this. Um, this is a, a kind of a fermented juice of uh, beer. Uh, fruit juice and sugar and molasses uh, drenched with uh, bad smelling bananas that sat for a month in my garage. And then we mix this together and smear it on the trees. This is the so-called baiting. And then we go with the flashlights at night. And then you find stuff like this, like uh, these beautiful underwing moths. And then there will be lots of moths sitting around them. And this is really beautiful. Okay, Tessa is going to enlighten you now about fruit flies a little bit because she is a really good fruit fly expert. <laughs> yeah, so uh, in addition to doing that butterfly and moth work, uh, I'm personally a little bit more interested in the fruit fly work. Um, as Thomas mentioned earlier, I've done some fruit fly catching even at home. But if you ask me how a fruit fly catching trip starts, it unsurprisingly actually starts at Walmart. Uh, you might recognize this cart as being your Houghton Walmart. Um, so we asked them really kindly if you could please buy their old produce, um, as, especially bananas and tomatoes. Um, so a couple of weeks ahead of this or days a couple uh, in front of the trip, 
um, we go get the old produce and kind of just let it rot. <laughs> um, then when we get to the Huron Mountains or wherever you'd like to go fruit fly catching, uh, you put this produce out in the woods. Um, the tomatoes usually on the ground as I'm cutting them open here on the ground. And then the bananas hanging essentially in a bottle that uh, might attach anything that's uh, flying around. And then we leave them for a couple of, or ni of nights or so, so that they actually attract all the fruit flies. And then we come back um, as me here in the middle picture with a net that's pretty similar to one you saw when we were catching uh, butterflies, but smaller. And we essentially waft over our traps in order to catch any fruit flies that might be lingering around. Uh, and then we collect them in a tube. Um, these are kind of like, you can almost think of them as plastic test tubes with some food agar in the bottom to keep the flies hydrated and fed uh, while we bring them back to the station for identification. So as you can see on the next slide, uh, we bring them back to the lab. Uh, this is me looking at through the microscope to try to identify uh, that vial of fruit flies that you just saw. Uh, some vials might only have one or two fruit flies, but others can have easily 100 fruit flies, depending on uh, where we find it. So we're really interested in what kind of species and how many of these species uh, are at our locations. Um, so it's of high importance to sort them um, and count them. So if we look under the microscope, a, a fruit fly that we find in the wild might look something like um, we see on the bottom here, which at first glance is not all that easy to identify because yes, they all look similar, even if they're a little bit different. Um, so if you have any interesting species or any in species we want to use in our own lab, at this point, we can either decide to keep these flies um, or discard them. If we keep them, we put them back in the vials, and we bring them home uh, to our lab in Houghton. Um, and here we see Dr. Warner's office filled with uh, fly collections uh, from and, past trips uh, and, that we've either kept alive or bought. Are they, and so these are still, some of them are still alive at this point. Not today. I, I Not, <laughs> Exactly. Um, if you treat a fruit fly really nice, you know, if you keep them, give them nice amounts of foods, they might live about 120 days. Um, so, but eventually we have to cycle them um, and get rid of them. So we can identify them, uh, but this knowledge is um, not very widespread. Um, so one of uh, Dr. Warnes and a colleague, John Janicki's uh, goal was to make this information more readily available. Um, so what they decided to do is to design these encyclopedias of North American drosophilids. So there's currently two volumes out, one describing the Midwest and Northeast, and then another encyclopedia for the Southeast, in which there are many pictures of these beautiful fruit flies that you can go find on your own. And this is pretty amazing. They did an amazing job putting this book together. Um, and here we see Drosophila melanogaster, which if you before you're going to ask, yes, is the one you find in your kitchen. So if you left your fruit out too long, you will see this one. So I dare you, the next time that you see these around your kitchen, get really close and see if you can identify this specifically dark um, bottom area of the fruit fly. And you'll know, these are Drosophila melanogaster. But there's many other species. For example, this is Drosophila suzukii, which is a hugely invasive species. And you can easily identify it by the spot on their wing. Then there is Drosophila athabasca, which you might find in your trash, but look at how dark it is compared to the other species that we previously saw. Uh, and then here we have other pretty species, including Drosophila buskii, which is um, nicely striped compared to other species. Neotestacea, which um, has more, um, which is way grayer and has less pigmentation, but is actually, um, can eat some poisonous mushrooms that we would not recommend you eat. Uh, so it's pretty amazing that these small animals can be resistant to a toxin that um, will easily kill a human. And then we have this one, which we think is probably the most pretty one in the book. Um, it's almost like a cow, really. <laughs> um, in the book, there's also some fruit flies that don't look as anatomically correct. Um, this is our children's bedtime story, which um, has a version in both books or two fruit fly families go on countless adventures. Um, and they're included in the hopes that any scientists with children or ed educators uh, with um, kids 
will show these to their um, kids in order to get them excited about fruit flies, because this is not just a book for identification, it's a book to get people excited about science. So we hope that anyone who's interested will um, show these pictures and these stories to their children in order to create some enthusiasm about the field of science and especially fruit flies. So here's my, I'm taking all one out. Uh, here's my favorite uh, genus of fruit flies. They don't go to fruit, but they fly around your head. So you don't need to bait them. You can just collect them around yourself. Now, um, when Tessa joined my lab, there were uh, three Amiota species in the area, Amiota minor, Amiota mariae, Amiota leucostoma. Then Tessa joined my lab. And I modified this today. This is Tessa winning the, winning the uh, Provost Award at Michigan Tech. And I put all of her awards. I tried to squeeze them all on here. So today she got the graduate fellowship this morning, the NSF graduate fellowship, which is a very rare one. She's the Barry Goldwater Award winner. She won the Provost Award, basically best student at Michigan Tech. Departmental Scholar, Songership, uh, Songer Research Award, Scholar of Prominence, Outstanding Graduate Research Award, Surf Award, Sawyering Award, and she has 12 publications and five more manuscripts hanging out under review and being written right now. So she is going to publish more papers than I had when I became associate professor. Uh, so, um, and when you have these two things together, and you happen suddenly as a biologist to discover a new fruit fly species, uh, what do you do with it? Well, maybe you name it after your best uh, student you ever had. So I found in the Huron Mountains next to this waterfall, uh, while Tessa was helping me in the Huron Mountains, I found a fruit fly species that I thought no one has ever seen this before, no one has described it before, and it turned out to be a new species to science. So I called it Amiota Tesse in honor of Tessa's accomplishments. All right, here is Tessa's species. All right, so before they were three, now we have four. All right, so that uh, was a real fun thing. Now I would like to acknowledge a couple of uh, people. Uh, first of all, the people in the Huron Mountain Wildlife Foundation for giving us money since 2014 to go to the Huron Mountains. I would like to uh, thank the NSF, not only for giving me money, but also for giving Tessa money this morning. Uh, I would like to <laughs> thank Tessa, of course, for all of the many years of help and successes that always look good on me too. I would like to uh, thank John Jenicki, uh, who is uh, the co-author on our books and who taught me the fruit flies. I would like to thank Natalia, my daughter, who became the illustrator of my two books. And she was illustrator of the first book when she was five years old, official illustrator, that's pretty cool. I would like to thank Jim Bess, who taught me a little bit about the moths of uh, North America. Uh, he is a really great expert and uh, my friend. So we always talk about moths when we meet for coffee. And uh, I would also like to thank my first butterfly that I caught in 1981, because without that one, I would have never uh, become a professor in biology, never met Tessa, never, went to the Huron Mountains, never named the species after someone. So um, I would like to thank all of these people and animals. And um, now the books are free. Here are two QR codes. This is my last slide here. And then we take some questions. If you go to the left QR code, you can for free download the first book of the Midwest and Northeast. And if you take this QR code, this is basically the second book. And these are freely downloadable books uh, from our digital comments server at Michigan Tech. Okay, so um, enjoy those books and maybe read some stories to your children as well. Okay, and with that, thank you very much. And uh, we are ready to answer some questions here. Well, um, so first of all, thank you, um, Dr. Werner uh, and Tessa for bringing us joy this evening. This was just a really delightful talk. You, you brought us um, memories of being outdoors in the summer and, uh, and uh, just a love of science and discovery. Um, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna invite the audience to ask questions. To ask a question, use the Q&A feature, just type your question in there. And Tessa and Thomas, you can choose to answer a question at any point. If you want to answer a question, just click choose to answer live. And okay. then once it's answered, answer it. 
I'm going to lead it off by asking one question to Tessa. Could you explain to us what is an accelerated master's degree, which you earned here at Michigan Tech? Yeah, um, so after my three and a half years of undergraduate, I really decided I wasn't done at Michigan Tech. Um, so Michigan Tech um, offers a four plus one program uh, where you essentially start taking graduate classes while you were in your last year of your undergraduate and then uh, in the following year as well. And that then combinedly gives you a master's as well. Uh, you can either go through like more of a course base or a more thesis based route. So either you take many classes and you have to do some more like written exam or you can do a thesis in which you uh, have a project that usually you've been doing since your undergrad that you carry forward into a master's and then defend on. So I was luckily enough to have a project that was running throughout my undergrad um, that I actually led. And I really wanted to see this through to the end and make sure that we had data that was uh, publication worthy. So I decided to tack on that extra year, take those extra classes and um, get my research to a point where I could write a thesis and a publication on it. And I successfully had to defend that um, back in December. All right. Very nice. I found a question I would like to answer here um, from John Sawyering, <laughs> the generous funder of Tessa. Um, As there are, uh, are there physical differences between the antennae of moths and butterflies? I assume that they are that they are each better tuned to different freak. Oh, they are better tuned to different frequencies. Um, so the butterflies, they they smell. So moths and butterflies, they uh, they smell with the antennae. And uh, in moth mating, they have to attract uh, their females. The females attract the males from a far distance, up to a mile, maybe sometimes even ten miles. And the the male antennae are feather-like that increases the surface of the receptor area and they can detect uh, their females calling with pheromones from a very far distance. Butterflies don't need that extra surface because they are finding their mates by sight and then uh, on short range they are actually doing the pheromone game where the male actually produces the pheromone and rubs it into the female's antennae to make her willing to have sex. So there's a little bit of a difference, but yes, the anatomy of the antenna uh, is actually different because of uh, the range of uh, pheromones that need to be detected. All right. All right, this. wait, 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 Tessa, Tessa's answering the question by typing. Kevin asks, where do fruit flies lay their eggs? <laughs> well, I've, uh, Thomas finishes sentence, but- oh, I, uh, I'm done. <laughs> I'll, yes, I'll quickly uh, answer Kevin's um, question about where fruit flies lay their eggs. And yes, he's actually correct. They lay them on the fruit um, so that the larvae have plenty of room uh, to eat it and grow. Very nice. What are your favorite moths? So what do I do? I click on answer live and then speak in here, right? Yep. Uh, so, and okay. click on answer live. Yep. Very good. So uh, Tessa, what are your favorite moths? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I really have a favorite moth. I'm going to be honest here. I mean, it's really exciting to go out and catch them. Uh, but I can't say that I have a very particular, but I know there are very beautiful ones with beautifully colored hind wings. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like uh, I like the underwing moths, and I also like the giant silk moths. They make me always excited. Giant silk moths are cool. Well, and I don't know if you were answering Ellie's question or a different one, but again, people want to know what your favorite ones are. And I guess a, a related one would be up, up here in the UP. If there's a if there's a particular butterfly to notice because it's rare or something, what would it be? Ah. They would be very small and brown ones that don't even have um, English names. Um, well, yeah, there are some some coppers that I'm after, like, uh, but they are very small and you wouldn't even see them. I would get really excited about that if I go to a place and uh, just like just like a parking lot with some weird grass and then suddenly some small thing is flapping around. 
and I, I go like totally crazy and nobody even sees what I'm running after. Um, so, the, the, <laughs> you know, um, if you see something re really colorful, that's probably really boring for me. I would say, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a, like I have seen that a thousand times. I go for the very small stuff that is super hard to find. Um, but what I enjoy is uh, the swallow tails and I enjoy the white admirals because this is just beautiful. If you go on a hike and you see them sitting like dozens of them covering like these, uh, these puddles, that's just beautiful. I mean, I, I like this very much, but about favorite butterflies, my favorite butterfly um, is actually this one here. <laughs> uh, okay, so Tessa did a really good job. This was her goodbye present. Uh, this is actually a Parnassus butterfly. She made that really nice um, because a Parnassus butterfly I've never seen in real life for many, many years. And when I was like over 40 years old, I got to see my first Parnassus in the Rocky Mountains. And I almost got knocked out by the overwhelming feeling to see one of those. And so Tessa made me one, um, and this is hanging on my little light here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's see, what else do we have? I have, a, I'm not going in order here, but the oldest ones are on top, right? Let me just see. Okay. Um, what is the purpose of so many moths being beautiful in their colorations? Protection. Tessa, you want to try? Um, I, I mean, I'm guessing, yeah, mate attraction, but also um, warding off predation are both very important aspects to why they have their colors. Yeah, especially the last one, the warning, uh, because when they sit, usually the, the forewings are camouflaged and look like bark, and the hindwings are very colorful. So if they sit on a tree in the middle of the day and the, the moth is sleeping and the squirrel comes and tries to eat it, it will flash the colorful hind wings and the squirrel gets a shock and uh, gets scared and then the moth can fly away. So because in the dark, they usually, they don't use a, a sight for mating. Um, definitely uh, to scare off predators during the day. All right, I got this. Oh, here is one. This is a lot of questions here. Are oh, Luna moths on the decline? I just see what is in front of me. It seems they are not as prevalent as they were 50 years ago. Not sure why. I can tell you why. They are declining. And uh, the gypsy moth invaded North America. And then people wanted to find a natural enemy for the gypsy moth. So they brought some parasitic flies from Europe because the gypsy moth is from Europe and they released the parasitic flies in the hope that the parasitic flies attack the gypsy moth. Unfortunately, um, the giant silk moths were more delicious than the gypsy moths and the parasitic flies completely ignored the gypsy moth and killed all of these uh, lunar moths and all the other um, silk moths, right? So you've got to be careful what you do when you try to change nature and you try to bring things back. Uh, these things can backfire pretty heavily. Um, okay, here is one uh, from Bob Piersma. Just where do fruit flies originate? Are they inherent in fruits? Tessa, you are a biologist. Do they spontaneously originate? <laughs> Sadly and luckily, no. Uh, they do tend to migrate um, up and down. Uh, the ones, however, that you have in your kitchen, there is a likelihood that there might be an egg or a larvae on your fruit when you buy it. Yeah. So that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. And also, they come in kitchens if you have like this fan over your stove. Uh, if, and you have a, a compost outside, that's what usually happens. Fruit flies come through the smallest cracks inside. If your house is not airtight sealed, which no house is, fruit flies always find their way in. So try to push out your compost as fast as possible, especially any fruit things like bananas and banana peels. All right, so we did this one. Oh, okay. Uh, this one I answered. Let's see. Tessa, do you find anything what you want? Yeah, I've been looking. I've been. And remember to click answer live when you're answering it, and that way you know what you've answered. Yes. Okay. 
Oh, there's um, so many questions. So just to yeah. give I the know. audience an idea, there's 26 open questions and nine answered questions. So okay. we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to hit it hard, fast. Okay. <laughs> Are fruit flies prey for other life forms? Yes, parasitic wasps. All right. I'll add, I'll answer Ron Friesman's uh, question. Uh, yes, there is migration patterns due to climate change. Uh, that's actually the core uh, of our studies in the Herm Mountains is to see how populations change over time with differences in temperature. Okay, here. Are you aware of the location of the Stonington Peninsula where the monarchs congregates? Actually, I found it by accident. There is a little lighthouse and I... I I was there, I was wondering what all, all these cars doing here. So I got out of my car and thought, what the heck is going on here? It looks like Mexico, right? They were like all <laughs> congregating. That's like the southern tip of the upper peninsula, I believe. Um, I, this is very cool. Um, do butterflies go out at night or just moths? Uh, in North America, butterflies don't go out at night, but in other places, not in Europe, but in Africa, probably there are some butterflies that are nocturnal, as there are moths that are diurnal. So um, there are day active moths here, but not day active butterflies here. All Jack right, this, the snow report from Ralph, um, we are at 305 and a half inches. Ooh. And I think we're done. I'm pretty sure we're done <laughs> snow wise. I just want to say. It certainly looks like it. Um, oh, here, Jacob, Jacob, Jesa. Congratulations, Tessa and Thomas. How many species of Drosophila do you estimate are in the Huron Mountains? Uh, and how does that diversity compare to other ecologies in the world? There are 5,000 fruit flies in the world. Uh, in the Huron Mountains, there are about 25 fruit fly species. Um, in the Midwest and Northeast, there are about 60. In the Northwest, there are about 80. In the Southeast of America, there are about 80. And uh, the next book we are writing is the Northwest with 80 species. And then the last book we are writing is the Southwest with 180 species. That's why I keep this for the last because it will take me a long, long time to work with so, this. So, all right, I have a question. So if we buy bananas from South America or something and they come here, do those fruit flies have a chance of, of propagating here? They would if there would be eggs in there, yes, I, I think so. We have many invasive species like the spotted wing Drosophila came from Southeast Asia and now it, it is across the North American continent. It's a huge pest. Even our Drosophila melanogaster that we find in the kitchen, that's an African species. Mm. It's uh, yeah, many species are now distributed worldwide. Um, okay, are there any carnal? blue butterflies in the UP? I don't think so, but they are further south, like northern Wisconsin. I know that they are. I haven't seen corner blues in the UP. Um, yeah, I don't think so. Maybe there is some <laughs> hidden place. Uh, no one has told me. Uh, Ron Riesman, great job, Thomas and Tessa. Very fun and informative. All the best with your continued education, Tessa. Go Dutch. Yes, Tessa, go Dutch. <laughs> OK. Uh, Chas Winters, what insect specimen in your personal collection are you most likely to brag about? Um, well, I would brag about this one because I got it from the famous Tessa Steenwinkel who um, won all the awards Michigan Tech has to offer. That's I'm proud about. And none of the moths and butterflies in my collection, they are all equally good. Um, <laughs> Uh, what That's not else? true. You have your first one. That's important. Oh, the first one. The very first. Oh, yes. I actually smuggled it to the United States in my hand luggage with a pin. <laughs> with a pin. On the... <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't find it. That's what I'm proud about. Yes, that's that's true. That's why you are right. Um, so, by the way, um, um, URLs to the digital books have been posted in the chat. So oh, if you just good. go to the chat, you can launch them on your browser and then you can download them very easily by want, doing that. Yeah, if you want to see what they really look like when they are printed, this is the, the volume one third version. And this is volume two. This is well, a little bit flip, thicker. Flip it open to a random page. <laughs> uh, oh, this is the fruit fly that we used to work on in the lab, Drosophila gutifera. Very that must be why it opens to that page, you know, it's been used. 
Yeah, and uh, here are some children's stories. Look at these nice children's stories right here. They are so beautiful. There um, you go. Yeah, my kids love them. When I start reading them, oh, again, again, again. So that's really nice. Oh, Carl Ritos. Now let's answer his question. What is your favorite butterfly in Colorado? And you know what my favorite butterfly in Colorado is. It's the Parnassius. Exactly this one. Unfortunately, my um, <laughs> my camera cable is so uh, it is so um, short. Uh, I can't reach very far. Yes, uh, that is actually the Parnassus, and I, I I saw it. This is my father-in-law. He brought me up to the mountains a couple of years ago in 2018, and uh, we saw the Parnassus, and I almost tipped over. I don't know if, if it was the thin air or what it was, but I was like, oh my god, this is uh, too much, too much for me. <laughs> it was good. It was very good. Um, Tessa, do you find anything? I don't want to ramble about you. <laughs> anything you like? I see, I think there were a lot of questions that were between the difference between a, was it um, two different kinds of moths? Let me see if I can, you can answer a different one while I try to find it. Well, well, while you're looking for that one, um, what senses do butterflies have other than smell through their antennae? And one, is one sense more prevalent than another or, uh, or is that different by butterfly? They're, they're sometimes different. Some of them can hear. Moths can hear vibrations sent out by bats. And when they hear that the bat is targeting them for their radar, they drop down dead on the floor in the middle of the night. Well, they pretend to be dead. They, they, they fall down on the floor to get out of the sonar of the bat. Uh, butterflies taste and moths taste with their feet. When they yeah. sit on a substrate, they taste the substrate, okay? And they can see. If you show them a movie, it looks like a slideshow to them because they have a they have an image resolution of 200 frames per second. We only have 24 frames per second. So don't watch a movie with the butterfly and uh, <laughs> expect them to be entertained. They will ask you, why do you show me a slideshow? You promised me a movie. Um, right. okay. this, is a, this is a very deep question from Jerry. Um, you mentioned a fruit fly is close to the human genome. What are the numbers to make this so, and maybe you might, just describe some of your yeah okay yeah. 500 oh tessa do you want oh well i wasn't going to go specifically into the number but i think that on average we say that about 80 percent of human disease causes genes can be found in fruit flies um so we can usually if you if there is a particular um, disease that's associated with the gene we can usually model that in a fruit fly it might not give the same results when we alter it but there is some sort of equivalent yeah and what are the advantages of modeling it in a fruit fly Fruit flies are they're easy to breed, right? If you think about how many multiply in your kitchen, they replicate really fast and they don't take much to grow. And you don't need to kill humans in order to see what you do. That's also right? good. Yeah, ethical issues. It's cheap, it's small, it's fast, and it works. Because we share many, many genes. The reason why we share so many genes is that our last, there was a last common ancestor between fruit flies and humans that lived about 500 to 550 million years ago. That was a worm-like creature that had all the genes that are important to build an embryo and these, and also to defend themselves against foreign invaders, because that was actually used to scavenge for food before, right? All these bacterial receptors were used to actually find bacteria to eat, and they sticked around, and uh, now we are using them as our immune system. So um, since we have a common ancestor with fruit flies 500 million years ago, we share most of our important genes with them. And that makes fruit flies super important models for human research. Um, and most of the genetics of human diseases we know only because we have done the research on fruit flies before. Okay, all right. That's there were a lot of questions about a tent caterpillars i saw if some can, of them can, I, if you can touch on that i think that'd be highly appreciated okay good here yeah, answer life k benedis are tent caterpillars the same as gypsy moth no they are not uh the tent caterpillars are always in tents uh usually in may gypsy moth caterpillars usually sit on tree trunks uh without any tent and they are usually sitting there in june and beginning of july 
And then you see also forest tent caterpillars, which look like Eastern tent caterpillars, but the forest tent caterpillars, they don't make these nets and tents. They also sit on tree trunks in like a big mirror of 200 caterpillars next to each other. And then they migrate up in the trees and eat, and then they come back to the tree trunk. So there are different ones. Okay, Tessa, did you see any other ones? So many, I can't even. Yeah, do moths contribute to pollination? You wanna answer that? I mean, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> good, good. Click, click on answer live and go on. Okay, here's one. If you want, if you want to get into research-based, re insect-based research, what would you suggest to look at first? Should we just pick a favorite species or is there a good model insect like Melanogaster sort to of start with? I personally find rhinoceros beetles very interesting. Um, I would say these days, uh, sequence your species, try to breed it if you can breed it in your lab or backyard and then uh, do CRISPR-Cas9 to demolish the genes and uh, have fun with those. Uh, try to go wild. Uh, don't be intimidated by limitations that we used to have. Uh, there are many new techniques that, that come out. Uh, I personally don't like the model organisms too much because if you work with them, then you can never be uh, the best at anything. You always have to dare and do something that no one else thinks uh, can be done. And when you can do it, then uh, good for you. Nice. All right, all right, I'm seizing control. So oh, one huh. more question for Tessa and then um... Um, we're going to give Tessa a chance to give some closing remarks mm -hmm. and then Thomas. Um, so the last question for Tessa, and then I'm going to thank the audience. Tessa, what will be the focus of your PhD studies or dissertation at Baylor? And what yeah. advice might you have to any sort of high school students who are considering studying at Michigan Tech? Yeah, um, going for it. I'll be going further into reproductive medicine. Um, I really enjoy exploring the connection between nutrition and fertility. Um, in the Warner lab. And that is something I'm gonna push forward, but hopefully in a human clinical setting. So I really fell in love with Michigan Tech when I saw what kind of research they were doing. So if that's something that is important to you and you've already seen some of these Husky bites and they've gotten you excited about what is going on at Michigan Tech, you can definitely go see these professors if you're ever here, even if that's just for a visit or if you would just like to chat with them one-on-one uh, -on -one at some point. I think the fact that um, all these professors and other people we've invited to these talks are willing to come and talk to all of you means that they're super interested in what they're doing and they're wanting to share it with you. So if you are interested, they'll be more than happy to have you. Oh, most excellent closing remarks. And if, if I had listened to this talk when I was graduating high school, I would have probably become a biologist. I'm sure I would have. Um, so I'm going to thank our audience for joining us. Uh, it has been a tremendous season. It has been so wonderful to learn so much with you. Um, please join us again in fall. Uh, please take care of yourself over the summer. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Thomas Werner to yeah, close us out. I would like to thank everyone who joined us today and also Janet for inviting us to give this uh, seminar. Uh, I would like to thank Tessa for being the most amazing student I ever had and for also giving her time tonight uh, to give a presentation together with me. And uh, for the audience, I would like to ask you, please download the free book and read the children's stories to any children you have in the radius of 25 miles or so, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and also, if you want to collect some fruit flies in the book, there are instructions of how to send fruit flies to me to the lab and how to package them. And if you find anything that I don't have as a picture in my book, there are many species that don't have uh, pictures, I will acknowledge you in the book and you will be engraved in the book forever, okay? In the acknowledgement. So if you see anything cool or just are curious what this is, contact me and send some fruit flies to me by FedEx. All right? So thank you very much, <laughs> everyone, uh, for joining us. Today. Oh, everyone, please have a wonderful spring and summer. And I look forward, we look forward to seeing each other in the fall. Um, take care, everybody. Good night. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Thank you, guys.